Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to rekindle your connection with nature, Mother Earth, and the natural world all around you, then do we have the Braiding Sweetgrass Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Robin Kimmerer. Dr. Kimmerer is a mother, plant ecologist, writer, and SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. She's also the founding director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. She's the author of several beautiful books, including my new all-time favorite on reconnecting us to the natural world and Mother Earth, Braiding Sweetgrass. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teaching of plants. That plus we'll talk about the importance of saving tadpoles, grandfathers and pecans, why asters and goldie, goldenrod look so beautiful together, how squirrels get maple syrup, how firewood warms you twice, uh, a shiny red kayak, and what a Louisville elm has to do with anything. <laughs> So welcome to the show, Robin. Are you ready to shine? So glad to be with you. And so, so, so glad to have you here, Anna Mighty. Woohoo! So before we dive right into things, can you tell us the story briefly of Sky Woman and the Geese? Oh, I'd love to. The Sky Woman story is a creation story, a fragment of a creation story that's shared by many people throughout this nation of sugar maples in the Northeast. And the story begins, well, let's begin in, a, in the middle, because Sky Woman lived in the sky world where we life was very much like it is here today. People grew their gardens, raised their children. And in the sky world, there stood only one kind of tree, and it was called the tree of life. Some people call it the tree of light. And on that tree, can you imagine every kind of berry and medicine and tree and grass, all of the plants were represented on this one tree. And in the sky world, just as here on Earth, a great wind came by and one day toppled that tree. And so a beautiful young woman who we call in our language Gish Kokwe, the sky woman, went out to look where the tree of life had fallen. And it, it had pulled up its roots and there was a great big hole there. And so like any of us, she wanted to see what was underneath. And so she went to the edge of the hole to peer down and there was only blackness. And she wanted to she was curious and wanted to look farther. And so she bent over the edge of the hole and looked down into the darkness and the earth began to crumble at her feet. She lost her footing and began to fall. And so she grabbed onto the uh, tree of life just to grab a branch to stop her fall, but it broke off in her hand and she fell. And she fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on the wind. And she was falling in a shaft of light because everything else was darkness, but light was coming through from the, from the sky world and all around her was nothingness. And you can imagine how frightened she was to be leaving her home and everything that she knew into tremendous uncertainty. But that world wasn't empty. There was water below. And the water beings all looked up at this sudden shaft of light. And in it, they saw just this little dust moat. And they thought, what is that? And as she spiraled closer, they could see that it was a woman with her arms outstretched and her hair billowing behind her. And they knew they had to do something. So the geese all rose up as one and flew up to meet her. And they caught Gish Kokwe. They caught this young woman on their backs. And so the first encounter between people, the new people who were coming and the, and the beings of the earth was of care and rescue. And they brought her down to the water and held her there. And all the other water beings came together and understood that the geese couldn't hold her, not forever. And the turtle who was floating there in this council of water beings said, here, let her rest on my back. And so Sky Woman stepped off the back of the geese onto the dome of the turtle. And uh, so she was saved. But of course, all those water beings said, well, 
this isn't enough. A person can't live on the back of the turtle. It's not good for the turtle or the woman. <laughs> and so they decided that they would make something substantial for her. And they had heard that down at the bottom of all of this water, there was some earth. And they agreed that they'd get it for her so she could have a place to live. And you know that great diver, the, the best diver of all of them, the loon, who we call Mong, um, said, I've got this, no problem. And he dove down, you know, the way the loons do. Um, he was gone for such a long, long time. And he came up with his um, water coming off his beautiful black and white feathers. And he said, I couldn't do it. It was too far. And so the otter said, I will. Same result. And the beaver and the sturgeon and all the water beings tried to go retrieve some earth for her, but they all failed. The pressures and the distance and the darkness were too great until the only one who was left was the little muskrat. And you know how little they are. And he said, I'll go. And all of his relatives looked on pretty skeptically, but he paddled with his little paws and kicked his legs and soon disappeared. And he was gone for a very long time. So long that they began to fear for him. And then a little stream of bubbles came up from the water and it was followed by the lifeless body of the muskrat. And they were grieving for their really courageous relative. When they noticed that his paw was shut and when they opened his fingers, there in the center of his little paw was a bit of earth. And he'd done it. And so the turtle said, here, spread this on my back. And so they put that, that bit of mud on the back of the turtle. And uh, Sky Woman was so moved by the gift of the animals, by the uh, their beautiful responsibility that they showed for her, that she began to dance. And the dance that she did spread that little bit of earth all over the back of the turtle. And that's the way our women dance today. In women's dance, our feet don't leave Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And it is in memory of that, of Sky Woman spreading that little bit of earth all around the back of the turtle. And as she danced, the turtle's back began to grow. And she began to sing. And out of her gratitude and her celebration of life, the whole turtle island began to form into the earth that we know today. And you know, you have to remember that Sky Woman didn't come alone. Remember that when she fell from the sky world, she had broken off a branch of the tree of life that had all those seeds and berries and medicines, and she scattered them all over the earth. And so the earth became this green living paradise that we have today through a combination of the gift of the animals and the gratitude and reciprocity giving her own gift in return for the gift that she had been given. And this is how we say that not only was our world formed, but our fundamental relationship with the world was taught by the action, the exchange of gifts between the beings of the world and humanity. Thank you so much for sharing. I had tears during that, was trying to hold it together for the interview. It is such a, a different framework for beingness than the Adam and Eve story. It, it couldn't be, in a sense, more night and day. Yes, and yet some striking similarities, aren't there? A woman mm -hmm. and a tree and a new place to live. But, of course, poor Eve was exiled from that beautiful garden. And what we know about Sky Woman is that she was a co-creator of that garden. And that that is where we continue to live today, in this, this beautiful place of, of gift from the, from the living world. Yeah, one story leads you to realize that, and, and it goes to a word. I'm jumping way ahead. We were ta you were talking in the book later on about verbs and and the verbs and the Potawatomi language, how there's 70% verbs versus 30% in, in like an English language. 
And, and one of the things I think of when I go running, and, and I love to run barefoot and connected to the earth is, and I tell people, they say, why do you run barefoot? I said, when you run barefoot, you're not running on the hillside. You become the hillside. Uh, you have that connection. Your language has that connection. And this story weaves in that connection where the, the Adam and Eve story is you're both exiled and you're passing through onto someplace else. That's right. So this isn't your home. And because it's not your home, well, actually, for guests, we should take better care of the place that we're, we're passing through. But that notwithstanding, um, there is nothing... Uh, nothing in it for me, in a sense, for taking care of it. It's not essential to our existence because it's not us, as strange as that sounds. So this sets up a very different framework for, I think, every decision you make in life. You're absolutely right. And that's the power of our creation stories, isn't it? Um, they tell us about our fundamental relationship to place. They, they, we call our creation stories part of our original instructions of how it is to be human and what might our relationship be with, with the places and the other beings who give us life. Can you tell us more about the original instructions? Yeah, the original instructions, um, you know, they vary tremendously from, from people to, to people, but they, they are stories and protocols and teachings that help guide us about how it is we are to live. And those original instructions help give us priorities for um, what are our human gifts and how do we give those gifts back to the earth. Our original instructions are instructions to always be grateful, just like Sky Woman was. Her first response was gratitude. Um, but after gratitude, um, there was reciprocity, giving her own gift. That's one of our original instructions. Um, so the original instructions are, 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 in a sense, guidelines. They're a compass. Among most of our people, there aren't I would say there are not a lot of rules for what it is to be a human being, mm -hmm. but there are compasses, um, and you you understand those teachings and then figure out the direction that you as an individual need to walk. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. From there, would you mind telling us about your your grandfather, a pair of trousers, and some pecans? <laughs> How he would laugh to think that this is how he will be remembered. Well, when you read that story, that was the first thought that came to mind. I'm like, how are you going to carry him? Well. <laughs> <laughs> the story is this. Among our, and it's a long story, um, our Potawatomi people are originally Great Lakes people. Um, from the southern Great Lakes is, mm -hmm. is where our people have spent much of our time and um, until someone else wanted that land and our people were removed from our Great Lakes homelands first to Kansas and then to Oklahoma to Indian Territory which is where my grandfather was born and 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 grew up in, in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And um, so the funny story is that growing up on the allotment, the land that was um, allotted to our family after the Dawes Act, in a, the notion was to give people private property rather than communally held gift of land. But they were on that allotment and hungry and uh, the story is that my grandpa was was out going fishing, and they didn't catch any fish, mm -hmm. but the pecans, which are one of the very generous trees of that Oklahoma landscape, um, were, were dropping nuts left and right. And so he wanted to bring some food home to his mom, and there they were, all these nuts, and they tried to pick them up, and you can't really carry very many. And so that clever boy took off his pants <laughs> and filled, tied the legs shut with the twine that were holding his pants up yeah. and uh, used it as a container. And he stuffed those pants full of pecans and, and brought them home for dinner. I love it. I love it. From there, let's go from pecans then and let's talk about how you were raised by strawberries. Hmm. You know, it's a long way from those pecans to my strawberries, 
because my grandfather, probably not very long at all, after bringing home those pecans, was hungry times in Indian territory, and the Indian agents were very eager to take the children away for the engines of assimilation, and my grandfather was put on a train at a little boy only nine years old to go back to the Carlisle Indian School, where he was raised oh. in an institution. I've got a strange question to ask. I was talking with my wife, Jessica, about this, and, and I have a, an interesting connection to the Navajo tribe which is, I, I almost married, I, I uh, dated a Navajo girl for six and a half years and spent a lot of time on and off of the reservation. And both her mother and herself, her mother was beaten and, and she would have her mouth washed out with soap if they dare speak the language at private schools where they weren't even really taught. Um, and, and Jessica, my wife, she's the, she's the producer, she asked, was this a, was this a, it happened, but was it part of a plan or did it just happen? Oh, it was part of a very big plan. The, the part of the, the taking of children was, in a sense, a last ditch effort after the Indian Wars and after allotment, after the federal government had done everything they could to so-called solve the Indian problem, mm -hmm. um, a, a general said, you know, it's really going to be cheaper to educate them than to kill them in warfare. And so the notion was that you could kill a nation by taking the children and depriving them of their families and their culture and their religion, and their language. And um, the whole goal was kill the Indian to save the man. When my grandfather graduated from Carlisle Indian School, think about graduation ceremonies, think about the celebratory nature of them, and think about the fact that the words that he spoke when he crossed that stage to receive his diploma were, I am no longer an Indian man. I will take, I will lay down the bow and arrow and take up the plow. That was the goal of the, of the boarding schools, was cultural genocide. Um, it was to exterminate culture, lay down the bow and arrow and take up the plow. So in answer to your question, it was absolutely intentional. And the miracle Michael, is that while those engines of assimilation were very powerful, very cruel and very powerful, it didn't work. Woohoo! Yeah, we're still here. We're still here. And this story of, of assimilation really leads me to your question of being raised by strawberries. Mm -hmm. Because all of that was taken from my grandfather. As a little girl, when I was growing up and I'd ask my dad, you know, what about this about language and about this? And I'd ask him all these cultural things. And he would have to say really sadly, he said, I don't know. That was all taken from us. That was all laid on the doorstep at Carlisle Indian School. And as a little girl, I remember thinking this, that, you know, if there could be schools to take all of that away from you, then by God, there ought to be schools to give it back. Um, and that has, that story and that motivation has um, been a major guiding story. It's part of my original instructions mm -hmm. is, is, is healing of that loss to the best of my very small ability to do that. I love it how you share about your father having the, um, I'll call it ceremony, morning ceremony of pouring coffee into the earth and, and how you can create a new story. You can create ceremony. It, it, you may not have the tongue and the language, which is obviously incredibly uh, important, but you can have the same um, meaning or emotion behind it, creating a new ceremony. Yes. And when people ask me if I grew up in a traditional household, well, we didn't have the language. There was so much that we didn't have. 
And yet, we grew up in the woods. That's how I was raised by strawberries. We were always outside and, and always honored all of those beings around us as our real teachers. And did I grow up with traditional culture? Well, you think, no. Well, of course I did. Because when we were out in the woods, my father had his ritual of every morning. Um, when the sun came up, when we began our day together, before anything else happened, he would make a gift back to the earth. And that gift was the first coffee of the day that he would pour on the ground and, and speak what were for me these magical words of here's to the gods of Tahas, which were the mountains that were around us. That's what survived assimilation, that my dad, an orphan, a cultural orphan in a way, knew to be grateful. He knew his original instructions were for gratitude to the life around him and celebration of the beingness of the world, even though there were all of those efforts to take it away. And um, so it is that kind of traditional knowledge that I grew up with. And I knew that the land could teach me what my immediate family could not. And, and the strawberries were part of that, and the pines and the birds, and um, I, I, I don't know how. I must have been a crazy, nerdy little kid. I know I was, always being out with the plants. But I knew that they were my source of, of, of knowledge. And they, and they were and they are. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I, I think if we can all get back there, this is one of the things and the joy we've been in, in uh, uh, New Jersey, just about on the New York border for the last year and a half. My, we came back here for my wife as, as part of a healing journey. And uh, she'd been very sick. And one of our summertime activities that has just been the most divine is pick the raspberry. Thank you pick the raspberry, thank you, trying to be as delicate as we can with both the raspberries and the plants and even where we step so that we don't damage anything. And, and um, even moving, you know, seedlings and plants around so, oh, you can grow a little better. Sorry, you're like trapped over here. What can we do to help out? I think the more time that you, that you spend in the natural world, the more this different way of treading with the world, of being, of interconnectedness, starts to, to, to rise up in you. Absolutely. And I can't think of a better way to nurture that than your beautiful story of picking berries. Because berries are such a gift, aren't they? Oh, um, yeah. There's such a gift there. They are all sweet and beautiful, dangling right there before you. The plant is offering them to you. And in fact, in our language, the word for berry, min, mm -hmm. is the same root word as the root word for gift. And so the berries really taught us about that the world is a gift and that we have to give our own gifts in in return and that's one of the things that i think we've lost isn't it that we think about we forget that the it is the earth that cares for us the earth that gives us all of these gifts and that we need to be able to give back in return for everything that has been given to us is that you talk about at the very at the toward the very end of the book there's a story about i'm not sure if it's if it's a birthday ceremony but it is it is certainly a ceremony where the person of honor actually gives to everybody else yeah um it's called the minute walk you see that word min in there Ooh. again it means the uh giveaway and it's a it's a ceremony that is that flows from our original instructions. I think it was probably taught to us by the teachers, the berries, mm -hmm. um, who are always giving to us. And in the, in the Western world, when something great has happened to you, you get gifts, right? People give to you. Um, but in, um, in, in, in Potawatomi ways anyway, the person who is, is being honored gives away. Um, you give the gifts. Um, because you have already gotten this great gift of good fortune in your life. And so then you give back, recognizing that good fortune 
is often comes to us because we are surrounded by people who are caring for us, by an earth who cares for us. It's an acknowledgement that we don't do anything alone in this world um, and that we are supported by all our relations, human and more than human. And so in return for the gift of whatever honor has come to you, you give the gifts back to everybody else. And it is... It is to me a beautiful reflection of, of the generosity of the earth. And again, that sky woman teaching of reciprocity. Let's go from there. Thank you for sharing on that. Along those same lines, we'll back up just a little bit in your book. And and I wanna I wanna talk about the the difference between and 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 um well, basically what happened with your daughter in sixth grade with one of your two daughters with the Pledge of Allegiance and then with the beautiful Thanksgiving address is because the Thanksgiving address is addressing a lot of what you're talking about. Yes, yes. Um, probably you and most of your listeners, we all grew up having to say the Pledge of Allegiance in our classrooms as, as children. And I don't know about you, but I didn't even really know what it all meant. I, but it was what we had, to, we had to do. Of course, as I came to understand what it really did mean, I had a lot of questions about it. Liberty and justice for all. That's, a, that's something that a young Native woman might question Mm -hmm. liberty and justice for all as my daughter did and when my daughter began um honest I had nothing to do with it (laughs) Um, she refused to say the pledge of allegiance in her um like middle school years and her teacher was a little concerned about that um but across the valley the Onondaga Nation, and I live in the ancestral territory of the Onondaga Nation. I'm so grateful to be neighbors with these, uh, with this amazing community. Um, they don't start their day with the Pledge of Allegiance because they are sovereign territory. They are not the United States, and their way of beginning the day is with the great Thanksgiving address of the Haudenosaunee, where in the Thanksgiving address, they greet, they send greetings and thanks to every element of the living world. They say thank you to the sun and to the moon and to the water. And as they go through and name each of those, they they are careful to say, well, because the waters are giving us life and caring for the plants and making home for the fish, they, they inventory all of the gifts that come to them. And they speak of the berries and the fish and the deer and the birds and the wind. And so this is how they begin. And in that chapter that you're talking about, I contrast what it means to give one's allegiance to a political entity like one's nation and what it means to have an allegiance to gratitude. An allegiance to gratitude to recognize all of the gifts of the living world and know that it is our responsibility to care for those gifts in return. And I have really adopted for myself and and I try to teach as much as I can about this notion that I really consider myself to be a citizen of the nation of maples. And I pledge allegiance I love it. to the nation of maples, which is where I live. Which is so beautiful. What is, um, it's in the same part of the book, I, I think it's so important that we start to, oh, no, this is going to be a pun, completely unintended, wrap our minds around it. What's it mean to be one mind or our minds are one? In the Thanksgiving address, um, in the cadence of those beautiful words, after the Thanksgivings to each of those elements of the creation, people say, and now our minds are one. And it is a coming together to recognize our common humanity as human people. Every one of us breathes the air. Every one of us drinks that water, benefits from the sun, the guidance of the stars at night. So now our minds are one. And it brings the group to a state of um, common ground, to recognizing that really we have everything that we need already given to us by the earth and that when our minds are one, those things that divide us 
become um, much smaller than our, our, our common ground that we, that we stand upon. Thank you. Thank you. Going back, I'm still thinking of the Pledge of Allegiance to the Maples. And there's uh, out here, there's a, there's a trail that Jessica and I like to run on. And there's two trees. There's, there's Ella the Oak, which we love to hold on to and to hug, or maybe she's holding on to us. And, and Olga, she's named Olga because she was carved maybe 100 years ago. Somebody to carve the name Olga into her. Like, we're sorry, uh -huh. Olga, but we don't know what else to call you. Olga the, the beech tree. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, and and that, that relationship that you can grow with the forest, even the forest in your own backyard, whatever it looks like. I'm wondering if you can share from here, there was a story in your book that absolutely brought me to tears, and maybe we back up to the very beginning of it, but I want to ask about um, the, a light being left on, a door being left ajar, the, mm -hmm. the Louisville elm, and asters and goldenrod. Mm. Well, first let me say in response how delighted I am that you named those trees. The coming to know as individuals mm -hmm. um, um, is so important. And the tree that you mentioned, the Louis Vieux Elm, is a tree with a name um, that was given it. It also has its own name, I'm sure. But, um, you know, at the beginning of our conversation, Michael, I was talking about how the plants had to be my elders mm -hmm. because I was disconnected from my community. And the story that you're talking about when that light was left on was the beginning of reconnection to my community of elders and the Potawatomi people. And this, I, this, the light was left on in a garage that I had to go turn that light off and say, why was that light on? I was working at an arboretum at the time. And standing there on the bulletin board was this picture of this magnificent elm tree. And it was called the Louis Vieux Elm. And I thought, what? How can this be? Louis Vieux, that's my ancestor. Um, that's my grandfather's grandfather. Um, what? I had never heard of this. And it was the championship elm. It was the biggest elm in the country. Wow. And it was right next to Louis Vieux's cabin on the, um, on the river in, in Kansas. And so it told his story. It told where the tree was. And so that was... A, you can bet that I was in the car not long after that <laughs> to go be in this place and to go visit the Louis Vieux Elm where I found our family cemetery and found all of the names and the connections. Um, the guiding came, light. The guiding light. The guiding light. And that going, that journey, pilgrimage really, back to the land um, of my well, I won't say the homeland of my ancestors, the place to which they were removed. Um, but but that was the beginning of how we really started to reconnect with our Potawatomi people. And I had been afraid, of course, that that those connections were completely severed and lost. And that wasn't true. You know, when we connected with our Potawatomi family, they'd say, oh, we heard of you. We heard of those, those, those walls who ended up in, in New York State. Asa's kids, after Asa had to go away to that Indian school, and they'd always wondered about us because wow. we were always wondering about them. And so there was a, a wonderful journey home, which continues. Did it light a fire under you or set you on a specific trajectory or path or mission, quietly or otherwise, in life? It, I would say that it illuminated the path for me because it was, again, as a child, I knew that so much had been lost. Mm -hmm. And I so much wanted to um, learn that again. And what I realized is that it wasn't just lost to me. It was, much of it was lost to all of our people. And so we were together in this journey to reclaim um, our original instructions. And uh, so it, it guided the way to me to teachers, to teachers and, and, and communities. And um, again, I, I want to emphasize that what I've been able to learn 
is this much. It's just as I think of as the moss on the mountain of the knowledge, um, just this much. And I'm incredibly grateful to the people who have shared with me and who have shared this journey. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, we're still here. It's, it's, it's awesome. I think it's so, so, so important. And, and in fact, maybe we should touch base, touch briefly on the language class that you attended. Because that was so beautiful, and I went online on YouTube, and and I was listening to the beautiful Potawatomi language. And can you tell us about that? Sure, sure. Um, at one of our tribal gatherings, I decided that I would sit in on some of the first of the language classes that were being offered for revitalization of our language, um, because, like. Most indigenous languages all over the planet, our language is an endangered species. And there, in our particular community, in the citizen Potawatomi community, there are very, very few speakers, and they are all quite elderly. And they very clearly gave us this message that if the language was to endure, we had to pick it up. And the young people had to learn to, to speak it. And, uh, and so that... Um, gathering with the elders and with a whole community of people who took up that challenge to say, yeah, we'll, we'll learn as much as, as, as we can. And again, I've learned just a little bit, but our tribe is in the midst of wonderful language revitalization work um, so that now I can study Potawatomi online using these very, very modern tools to study an ancient language. And um, there's immersion daycare in our in our oh, tribe cool. for the kids um, so there's there is a tremendous resurgence and the importance of learning the language is uh, so many many aspects to it but one of them is that the language really is a window into our culture because the way that we speak um, holds the ideas that underlie our, our, our culture and uh, the language actually holds our original instructions and you have to know the language to to see it I wonder if the original instructions and and I'm thinking about well, at least and, and this shows in I can't even believe there are this many countries there are 195 countries at least we're in 195 countries and and at least in the US most people are relative newcomers and and I wonder if that newness to the land is also a, a stripping away of our original instructions, our, those who, who weren't native to the land here. And if we go back far enough, if we all shared something of similar original instructions. Yes, and interestingly, I think it's held in the language. Let's think about those forces of colonialism and assimilation that tried to take our language away from the from us. And I want to say that it is at root the same question that you're asking. What was the experience of settler colonists? And what was what was what was their loss as well? And they're related and visible in our language. And it's this one one element of this. In the Potawatomi language, as well as many other indigenous languages, we speak of the whole world as if it was alive. The grammar of animacy. The grammar of animacy. And, and this goes back to settler colonialism and the loss in this way, in a very simplified sort of way. In English, we speak of one another with a particular grammar of respect. Mm -hmm. But everything else in English, except for humans, we call it. We call that sugar maple it, that salamander right? That black bear, that dandelion. In English, you're either human or you're an it. And if I said of you, Michael, oh, it's, it's talking to me, you know, how rude that is. I took away your humanity, your personhood. I disrespected you by calling you it, right? But that's what English does to every, every other being. All of our relatives are reduced to objects, but in indigenous languages, we speak of the salamander and the maple tree and the blue jay with the same grammar that we use for one another, for our families, 
because they are our families. It is so that when we speak in our every word, we are recognizing our kinship with the earth and that we're recognizing that we are all members of the same family. And that's what was taken from colonists as well, because this notion of the land, the land as living being, as relative, when you have to say it about it, that's a tremendous loss. Doesn't it makes you lonesome? It separates you Thank from you. that land, and and that's what colonialism was all about: is separating people from land. It was about turning sacred land into property, into commodity, into an object, so that it could be exploited at will. It was that the land was dead, and therefore we could do anything we wanted to it. And not only Native people have suffered from that kind of imperialism, um, but so has everyone, um, because it has separated us from the land and from one another. And that is held in that magical little word of it. To take it, I apologize, to take it another level, and it's something that you talk about in the book, anthrop I'll never get this right, anthropomorphism, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is if if we actually do try to talk to the salamander as if it's our brother, sister, mother, father, neighbor, cousin, son, or daughter, which it is, but if we do that, we're told you're human, putting human characteristics on it. That is the worst thing that you can possibly do. Mm -hmm. Well, it's true. It is very disrespectful to 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 suggest that a maple tree sees the world the way that we do. And and scientists are very careful about this, not anthropomorphizing, um, in order to really be able to have a valid window into the life of that organism. But the way, truthfully, that ends up getting used is to say that because they're not like humans, they must not have anything really going on there you know they're 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 not us they're other and therefore they are less than us but what I really try to think about is they are other than us and it's David Abrams wonderful expression of of not the not human world but the more than human world and of course um, this viewing of of all of the other beings as possessed of their own beingness they're not things, they are beings, mm -hmm. and they have their own intelligence, their own ways of being, their own their own original instructions. It makes you so much less lonely in the world, and it means that we don't have to figure everything else out for ourselves, because there are all these intelligences other than our own who know how to photosynthesize, right? Who know how to, to process nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it in the soil. There's genius. There's genius in our relatives. And it is in, 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 in many cases in a really powerful kind of intelligence of all beings that we lose when we when we start thinking about them all as objects, as as not sentient beings at all. I think when I run through the forest, I think of the trees as our teachers, as our guides. Jessica and I had a we've had some amazing experiences this summer on the border of New York with uh, with timber rattlesnakes, mm. and we came across a pair in an embrace in a Kundalini rising embrace. We actually wow. we got photos of it. It is we we asked for permission before taking the photos. We're like, do you mind? <laughs> And, and then we were visited by a timber rattler that climbed up on a tree in front of us. We didn't know snakes could climb straight up a tree and turned around and gazed with us for about 20 minutes. Mm. And, and we can only, I think we, we, had I had it to do over again, no regrets, but I would have tried to quiet my mind even more to understand what it was trying to tell to us. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's some powerful words of wisdom it wanted to share. I don't think any of those incidents that happen to all of us, if we, if we step back and are aware, we all have these, these strange and beautiful experiences with nature if we're going slow enough, slow enough to see them. Right. Slow enough and open to the possibility, open to the possibility of beingness. If you walk through a world that you believe is 
populated by its rather than by beings. Your mind is closed. Um, but if, as you say so beautifully, you, if you slow down and if you really listen and, you know, not listen as if you're going to be hearing voices, you know, it's not like that. It's, it is some other kind of knowing that is exchanged uh, among beings in a, in a language less way. We're tapping into capacities that have lain dormant in human beings for a long time because we have forgotten that we have the capacity and we have denied that our relatives in nature have that capacity. Sometimes people say, well, this is all very woo-woo, supernatural, and I think, no, we're not talking about supernatural at all. We're talking about superbly natural. Um, I like it. And we just have to remember um, how to do this. Once we became people of, of, of only human language, and especially once we became people of written language, we just started thinking that everything we need to know is within our own species. And, and we've forgotten that, that our teachers are, are all around us, and we have to be open and humble and, and, and learn to listen to them. I'm hearing in my head right now, go tend a garden. That yes. if we went to tend a garden, we would start to listen. We would start to be able to hear. I think you're exactly right. Uh, a garden is, is, is the first and best place, I think, to start to learn these lessons. Because then you, you really are participating in the thriving of, mm -hmm. of, those, of those plants. You come to know them as individuals. And you really come to know the world as gift. Um, that these gifts come from reciprocity between humans and, and the plants and the insects and the birds who are in your garden. Uh, oh, garden is school. It's the best school ever. I'll go from gardening school, and, and this one impressed the heck out of me, that you went through this kind of, well, there was, there was so many, there's so many layers to this. Your daughters wanted a home, and you were moving back to upstate New York, and they had a few requirements and maybe you can share what the requirements are and then just tell us about the pond and a mother's work. <laughs> Happy to. Oh my goodness, yes, I was moving back to upstate New York and I didn't have much money. I was kind of worried about this whole affair as a newly single mom raising two kids. And they said, oh mom, when you find the house, it has to have a pond that you can swim in. Mm -hmm. It has to have trees big enough for tree forts, one for each daughter. Of course. They, they weren't going to share. <laughs> it had to have a flagstone walk, um, like in one of their favorite books, and it had to have a purple bedroom. <laughs> Oh, the innocence of children, you know. I'm looking at mortgage rates in school mm -hmm. districts, and they wanted trees, a pond, and a purple bedroom, and, and I walked into this old, old farmhouse that was in such ill repair that I could afford it. And it had a purple bedroom. It Ooh. had a purple bedroom. And you know what? It had big ancient maples, perfect for, um, for tree forts. And it had a pond. Um, and when the snow melted the next spring, we discovered there was a flagstone walk. Um, it, it was the house that was meant for us. It was the place that called to us. And uh, that pond in the chapter, A Mother's Work, is, is the story of trying to rehabilitate that pond from its state of um, uh, eutrophication. I, it was just grown over with algae from all of the fertilizer runoff and because it was an old dairy farm. And um, so we... It wasn't swimmable, not by us. It was swimmable by tadpoles, but but not by children. And so uh, that chapter really describes everything that I learned, or some of what I learned, by trying to restore that pond to to vitality. Yeah, and it's 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 it was such it had to be both a labor of love, incredibly difficult, but such a nurturing of the land. Yes, yes. And that is when you understand and really, really feel the land as gift. Well, you know, when someone gives you a gift, you want to give something back, right? Um, and 
if you live in the country, you have that option of giving something back to the land. Well, that's another tangent, I guess. If you live in the city, you also have that option. But but caring for that land, taking that kind of mother energy, um, especially as my girls grew up and, and didn't need me materially as much as they did when they were little, um, that mothering energy I could turn toward taking care of the land, and taking care of the, the watershed and, and of, that, of that pond. So it was a very natural impulse um, for me to, to take care of that, that little bit mm -hmm. of, of, of water, that spring-fed pond. I think there's something so important. I went with with Jessica. We went a few years ago to what's called, I think it was Venus Crossing or Venus Passing. It was a, a celestial event. We went to the Big Island in a, a Big Island of Hawaii, where there were indigenous grandmothers meeting from around the world, and there was a, a, an indigenous grandmother from, I believe it was Seattle. It may have been Oregon, who was teaching us the importance of taking care of the water and of saying thanks and having gratitude for the water specifically and how important it is for our lives to keep the water and take care of the water. Oh, absolutely. Um, it is what gives us life, right? Um, what a miraculous, amazing substance is, 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 is water. It's so beautiful. And, and actually in Potawatomi culture, we are um, told, and this is said for many indigenous cultures, that the women have particular responsibility for the water um, because the water is a life giver, just as women are, are life givers as, as well. And so it's probably not a coincidence that it was a grandmother who was, who was doing these teachings. And you know, these teachings which are ancient are also urgent. When we think about the actions at Standing Rock, the courageous movement being born there comes from this same instruction, right? To take care of the water. Um, to give our gifts as human people back to the protection of those, those who, who give us life. Um, there can't be anything more important than caring for water. Couldn't agree more. I almost, I, I apologize for even asking about this one. This one just kind of wrinkled my gut in two. But maybe you can share what happened to your neighbor's trees and what's a, a windy, I, I won't pronounce it right, but a windigo, a digo, maybe economy, and what mm -hmm. we can learn from that. Yes. Um, you're referring to a, a story among our people of the windigo. And the Windigo is a, um, on some levels, is sort of a boogeyman. You know, it's this um, story of this monster. But as we look at, at what is beautiful in our cultures, we also look at what is ugly and say, what do we deem as a monster? And in our culture, the Windigo, this most uh, heinous of monsters, is a monster of consumption. The Windigo is a cannibal. And he's afflicted with a terrible illness. It's a human, actually, who has become a Windigo. And that terrible illness is greed. So that when the Windigo eats, the more it consumes, is never satiated, becomes hungrier and hungrier. And that our people name as monstrous. To be so hungry, to take, to consume so much that you jeopardize life mm -hmm. and jeopardize your community um, is the is is the thing that we hold up as most monstrous, and that story of the Windigo, this legendary monster, I think has a lot of teaching for us today, um, because I think that the economy and many of the institutions around us are Windigo economies. Um, our economies and our, many of our social and political institutions are asking, what more can we take from the earth? instead of what can we give to the earth. It is insatiable consumption. It is insatiable consumptions that leads us to dishonor the earth through exploitative um, economies. Um, and I think that in our current political situation, we have windigos afoot. We are, we are in a windigo world now. And so the teachings of, of, of Native people about understanding the monstrosity and the danger associated with that are, um, could not be more important in this moment. Thank you. Yeah, it's making me think I call it the disease of the moor. 
and and certainly an economy that is based on, as you talk about in the book, a perceived, it's a perceived because it's just the way we're, <laughs> where we are setting the systems up, a perceived lack of, of separation between people. And there are those who have too much and those who can't even get enough. Yes, yes. You know, these, these things that we suffer from today in this moment are things that are deeply part of, of human culture. And there were, in our original instructions, prescriptions about these things because we know, we know our tendencies, I suppose, in a way. Not, and I don't mean that that is our natural state, but we know the mistakes we can make. Mm -hmm. And one of those important teachings that comes again from Haudenosaunee people is to understand the land as one bowl and one spoon. There's a beautiful wampum belt mm -hmm. that holds this idea that says the earth is one bowl and there is just one spoon. And that bowl is this bowl of food. We are all fed from the land and there's one spoon, not a big one for some people, and a little one for others. There is one spoon. And so this powerful teaching of sharing the gifts that have been given to us and caring for keeping that bowl full, which we do by not taking too much, by being grateful, by reciprocating the gift, and by sharing everything that we have. Woohoo! <laughs> Can you tell us about brandy bottle flowers and a red kayak? <laughs> Yes, you know, I, the, the way I live in the world, there's teachers everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, the teachings of those brandy bottle flowers are um, this beautiful aquatic plant called spatterduck. Um, and the story you're referring to is, um, you know, a mother's work. When my last daughter went off to college, um, I knew... Oh, I spent the whole year being heartbroken that she was going to leave. And then I had to drop her off. Um, and I thought, okay, I am going to celebrate my daughter's independence and my own liberation mm -hmm. by going and paddling because I didn't have ever enough time to paddle. And so my, my beautiful red kayak and I went onto a beautiful lake and um, as, as consolation in a way for for the grief that that I was feeling and uh, and this story is is as I was you know bawling my eyes out as I paddled across this lake um, when I opened my eyes again you know my kayak had come to rest in this group of spatter dock lilies and all of those lilies are heart-shaped leaves um, surrounding me with this sense of love and these brandy bottle flowers, as they're called, that um, are connected to a whole physiological and anatomical system mm -hmm. of those spatter dock lilies that recycles energy between the generations, between the young and the old. Um, and it was, for me, again, sort of reading this landscape of, of the gift that these plants gave me of of understanding that love is always in flux um, and that it, that it never ends it's constantly being flowing between between generations and uh, so I'm, I'm grateful that you asked that story because it is in, in a way I guess a window on on when you really are connected in my case, to the plant world, mm -hmm. um, there are stories everywhere. You can't, you can't take a step without having stories and comfort and lessons and joy and warnings. All of those intelligences around you, sharing with you, if you're if you're open to the to the teachers that are around you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. On the note of wisdom, as we start to to, to wrap this up here. What words of wisdom would you give to parents for their kids today? Oh, my goodness. To have your children be with their grandmother, the earth, as often as they can be. We are careful to take our, our children to grandma's house um, and to recognize that, you know, we live in, in our grandmother's house and to have kids be 
outside, learning from the plants, receiving those gifts, you know, to have the joy of uh, just lying in the grass and looking at the clouds and, and coming to know themselves as, as um, a member of this beautiful community of life. And I think the other thing I would want to say to parents and in gratitude for my parents who thought this way is to recognize that every human being has their own gift. And just as we are recipients of the gifts of the earth, that every child should be supported in learning what their gift is. You know, what is the gift that they have to give back to the earth and, and to help that child um, to find out what that the name of that gift is and to learn how to give it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's a mighty woohoo! <laughs> I, I was going to ask you where people go to find your beautiful book, but maybe I should ask along those lines, what does braiding sweetgrass mean to you? The book or braiding sweetgrass? Ooh. Well, they're, they're sort oh. of inseparable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But which did you mean, Michael? I, I had meant braiding sweetgrass itself, but let's do both. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, first of all, braiding of sweetgrass is um, one of the uh, is a, is an activity which is simultaneously material and spiritual, because we braid sweetgrass because um, we say that sweetgrass is the hair of Mother Earth was one of the first plants to grow on Mother Earth from Sky Woman's hand. And um, if you think about the act of braiding, when you braid someone's hair or they braid your hair, you think of what flows between you, that wonderful feeling of being cared for, being seen, being cared for, and that that other person is braiding your hair, that you may be more beautiful and know how loved you are. And that's why we braid sweetgrass, because it's our Mother Earth's hair. So it is a tangible sign of our, of our tender, loving care for her. And so the braiding of, of, of sweetgrass connects the people on either end of that, but it also connects us in this powerful expression of gratitude to, to the Earth herself. Beautiful. Thank you. And then, of course, I've got to ask, what does it mean to you? And the book? The book is that metaphor. That book is the, those stories are the gift that I could give back to Mother Earth. I have been so privileged to spend my life quite literally kneeling before plants and learning from them. And in return for the gift of everything that they've taught me, I wanted to give that gift back in sharing the stories and the wisdom that they've given me. Thank you. It is such a beautiful book. We just scratched the surface. And this has been, to me personally, my favorite interview. I have just been on the verge of tears the whole time because this, this means so... When I say this means so much to us, I guess I'm talking both Jessica and myself and the kids we don't even have yet. But for all of us, this is, we can talk about spirituality all we want, but this is our mother, this is our, it's one tiny, small, if an intestinally small when viewed from a distance, little spaceship that we have. It's all we got. It's all we got. And and it's enough. <laughs> oh, it's everything. It's everything. And I think that as coming to really understand the land as Mother Earth, we know that we love the Earth. But what we have to remember is that the Earth loves us back. How can we destroy the one who loves us? We wouldn't do that. And so this really bringing into our consciousness that we not only love the earth, but that the love, the earth loves us back is, is one of the most important lights that we can carry. Woohoo! 
Mm. So where can people go to find your beautiful book and to find out more? Braiding Sweetgrass is available most everywhere. Um, hopefully you can go to your beautiful corner independent bookstore and 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 be part of that that reading community mm -hmm. um it's available from the publisher milkweed editions um to whom i'm so grateful but it's available in most bookstores and and online and uh it's 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 readily available thank you so much any last words of wisdom you want to share with people only to say that in recognition that we are showered every day with the gifts of the earth, that it is for each of us to give our gifts in return. Thank you so much. And in the words, I, I apologize for my pronunciation in advance. Megwetch. That's right. Megwetch uh, <laughs> is, our, is our great thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been truly beautiful, and, and I hope others are touched by it as much as I have been. So for everyone out there, i got to crank it back up for the finish. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get breeding sweet grass, and <laughs> get breeding sweet grass. <laughs> we can breed it too. And be reconnect <laughs> with Mother Earth <laughs> and shine bright. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you, Michael. What a great conversation. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>